Take Back Our Democracy. This is a first in a series, what we hope will be a series of programs that deals with our democracy and um, our vote, how we feel about it, what are the uh, limitations on the vote that a lot of people see these days, and how we can educate ourselves and do something about it. Uh, today's guests are Olivia Zink, who is uh, executive director of Open Democracy, and um, Jim Rubin, the Honorable Jim Rubens, who is a former Republican senator, state senator, and uh, also uh, ran for uh, uh, Senate, federal Senate a couple times. And Azer uh, Cole, who is uh, with, he's the New Hampshire state manager for American Promise. I think I have all that down. <laughs> so welcome everybody. Olivia, why don't you tell us a little bit about Open Democracy? What's its main focus? Open Democracy is a nonpartisan, nonprofit organization based here in Concord, and we work on campaign finance reform, um, uh, really working to establish a system of publicly financed elections here in New Hampshire, ending partisan gerrymandering, and working to make sure all of our campaign finance laws are enforced, um, including um, bringing about disclosure and transparency laws. Jim, now you're the uh, New England chair of Take Back Our Republic. Take Back Our Republic is oh. the nation's leading nationwide organization, the nation's leading conservative organization working toward uh, fixing our broken, corrupt campaign system. Okay. And there's overlap between the different groups working on this. Uh, we take the conservative pr perspective and as I say again, there's, there's considerable overlap. Mm -hmm. And Azer, you're uh, American Promise. Promise. American Promise is a cross-partisan organization working singularly on a constitutional amendment to allow Congress and the states to once again set reasonable limits on money spent in their elections. And constitutional amendments are supposed to be hard, and they are. And they only happen when majority of Americans on the left, right, and center come together and agree on fundamental principles that should be in our Constitution. And so we lead with our cross-partisanship. This isn't something that one party can do alone, nor is it something that one party should do alone. Uh, and, and all of our organizations here today back a passage of the 28th Amendment, mm -hmm. as described by Azor. Oh, great. Yeah. Uh, you, you use the term cross-partisan. Could I just ask for a brief definition of that? Because I'm, I'm used to the term bipartisan. I think a lot of our audiences and yeah, so we don't tell anyone to, you know, don't be, have partisan preferences. But one of the beautiful things about this issue is you might disagree on everything except this issue. And when you're working around this foundational sort of root cause issue of money in politics and how the Constitution has been interpreted to say that money is free speech, we can work together and still have our partisan affiliations, but when we're in this space, it's really cross-partisan, and that's why we use that term. Okay, great. Olivia, how is, what do you think about the influence of money in politics? Why is it a problem? <laughs> um, the influence of money in politics is a huge problem um, for our society. When we have politicians in Congress and in Concord who are working um, only to talk to corporate and big donors, people who can give them, write them the max amount of check, checks, we have um, politicians that are spending 40, 40 or 50 percent of their time dialing for dollars. Um, we really need politicians who are actually doing the public policy work for, for citizens. Um, we also have a problem where money influence on campaign contributions and in lobbying contributions um, are actually not allowing public policy decisions to be made for um, the needs of regular people. And we need to change and transform all of that so that the voices of everyday people are being heard in our political discourse um, and that the policy decisions follow from them. I could add, uh, from a conservative perspective, the, the problem with the concentrated big money system we have right now, where, where a very small number of donors uh, really determine which candidates are viable. I ran for U.S. Senate as a Republican uh, in the primary, Republican primary, in 2016. That election resulted in uh, Senator Maggie Hassan being elected. That election, $135 million was spent. $135 million in a state, a small swing state like New Hampshire with a million voters. 
and 95% of that money came from out of state. So a problem from a conservative perspective, we believe in, in states' rights. We believe in the Tenth Amendment to the U.S. Constitution, part of the Bill of Rights, which reserve to the states or the people respectively all powers not expressly delegated uh, to the federal government. And the reason that's in the Constitution, the reason the Tenth Amendment is so important, is that states have different needs. States have different approaches to problems. They have different problems. And states are the laboratories of democracy, wherein a state will experiment with a particular way of solving a problem, let's say a healthcare problem. And other states will look at what that state did. Did it work? Did it didn't work? So these laboratories uh, are, are the farm team for national problem solving. They did, uh, and, and, and states can look at the states which have successfully addressed a problem or, or failed to address a problem and replicate the successes. So we have wound up with a small number of these big dollar donors going into swing states, swing districts, even down to state legislative races, and, and flowing large sums of money behind particular candidates, recruiting candidates, even importing candidates into states to run, and determining which candidates are viable. So you're having people from Manhattan and San Francisco coming into swing states like ours, determining which candidates voters even get to look at and, and, and select among. And it's horrible for people who would like to see our state senators, our U.S. senators and congresspersons representing our unique needs. And it, it's resulted in the federalization, federalizing and nationalizing elections all over the country and making everything more uniform. And that's bad for, 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 mm -hmm. for people who believe in the Tenth Amendment, like many conservatives, many people do. And it's bad for the concept of these laboratories of democracy. So this is why conservatives object to this big money system where, again, a very small number of donors determining which candidates are viable, picking the candidates in the money primary before voters even get a shot. And actually, you and Azor uh, produced, uh, wrote an article that was published in The Hill, right, about, uh, well, let's see, Republicans should get behind the 28th Amendment. As a, um, you were a representative of American progress, promise, sue me, excuse me, and uh, you as a representative take back uh, our republic. So that right there is uh, an example, I guess. Of, and I can't uh, take any together. credit for that article. That, <laughs> that was written by Jim Except as, <laughs> as an associate of this. Azor recruited, me in, Azor recruited me into his organization's cause. Uh, mm -hmm. So I can credit Azor for doing an incredible job of making our state. The 20th state calling for this constitutional amendment, which is a very exciting victory that we worked together on to pass yep. HB 504, a bill calling for congressional action, moving this forward out of Congress with super majorities in both the House and the Senate, a really tall task to then be sent out to the states to be ratified by 38 states. Yep. Mm -hmm. And we're, we're almost a little bit over halfway there, I guess, because like you say, New Hampshire's a 20th state, and that's really great. Um, one of the things that uh, Jim mentioned, and I forget whether it was in the article or whether you're in your testimony uh, on the bill, uh, was too the, the impact on innovation even yes. in our society. You know. Yeah, I should explain how the big money political system works. It's winding up corrupting free market capitalism and turning our system, our economic system in the U.S. into what people call crony capitalism, where large companies or companies that can hire lobbyists and make millions of dollars of campaign contributions, rather than going to customers and providing innovative products and services, they go to Washington and they ask for tax breaks, regulatory favors, uh, preferential contracts, and so you win by buying politicians through lobbying and campaign contributions as opposed to better serving customers with better products and services. This has resulted, and we're seeing this in the United States, it's very harmful for free market capitalism. We're, we're seeing a reduced rate of innovation. We're seeing a reduced rate of new business formations. And that's, if you believe in capitalism, free market capitalism, as most Americans do, uh, you're, you're, you're bothered by this. Conservatives are seeing, in opinion polling, we're seeing young people, people 35 and under, uh, having uh, for the first time in, in the history of polling, having a favorable view of socialism. 
We're seeing people of color, people who are non-white Americans, having a favorable view of socialism, and in that case, a disfavoring view, disfavorable view of capitalism. So again, from a conservative and Republican perspective, we're behind this approach because we see how this big money system has corrupted the political system. It's corrupting free market capitalism. So all of us are here together. We have different reasons for getting behind this. We have different approaches to fixing policy problems. We might have different approaches to infrastructure or, or health care reform or war and peace. But we are finding that our federal government is frozen in place. Uh, we have gridlock and, and the plumbing of the United States of America is not working anymore. We're not solving our problems. So all of us, we might have different approaches to solving these problems, but not solving them is horrible for our, for our United States. This is where we agree mm -hmm. and this is why we're together on looking for these reforms. Mm -hmm. And any problem you wanna solve, um, whether it's in Concord or in um, Congress, what we need to do first is um, end the influence of big money in politics. Because if big money in politics has a grip as, as tight as it does and has the rules rigged in the favor, everyday citizens are not getting their voice heard in our political discourse. And it's important that we um, end this influence of big money in politics. Um, we, government is not in place to pick winners and losers. Um, and, and the system is distorted. It leans towards the green. It leans towards, if you have uh, the primary, our primary elections, we, we basically have a money primary before we have a regular primary. And we can't recruit good candidates to run for office because really what they have to be is a good fundraiser, mm -hmm. not a good public policy. Um, yeah, and I, I know, and sometimes if you contribute to one person, all of a sudden you have 10 or 20 people asking you for money. Well, if you, So if, it's out there. I can tell you from personal experience, if you're running for high office, as I have run for U.S. Senate twice, <laughs> reality is you fly to New York and Washington and you check in with big money sources to see if you're viable or not. And if you get the cold shoulder in those visits, it's highly unlikely unless you can self-finance to the tune of, for U.S. Senate, tens of millions of dollars, you're not even going to be visible to the mm -hmm. voters. Mm -hmm. And the voters will not have, not that I'm the best candidate or anyone else, but if, if candidates are visible to voters, only those who are approved by someone yeah. in San Francisco, <laughs> Manhattan, or Washington, the needs of your individual state, like New Hampshire, a swing state like ours, not being met anymore. Mm -hmm. Azar, why don't you, Azar, tell us a little bit about some of the history and some of the uh, legislation and uh, court rulings that have influenced this. Yeah, well, this is an issue that Americans are united on. A University of Maryland study found, I believe, 66% of Republicans and 85% of Democrats want this constitutional amendment. And I'll give just two examples of Congress, bipartisan majorities of congressional representatives and senators coming together. The first was in 1971 with the Federal Elections Campaign Act, which really strongly enforced campaign finance regulations and gave states really powerful ability to set reasonable limits on money spent in their elections. Just a couple years later, the Supreme Court in Buckley versus Vallejo stripped down much of what a bipartisan majority of legislators had just passed. And for the first time, issues of money in politics were constitutionally decided not in the political sphere, but in the constitutional sphere. They were grouped in with free speech issues. Again, in 2002, the Bipartisan Campaign Finance Act, often known as the McCain-Feingold Act, again, strengthened our ability to meaningfully regulate money spent in our elections. In 2010, the now infamous Citizens United versus Federal Elections Commission Supreme Court decision said, no, no, you can't do that. Money is free speech. It's synonymous. And in the eyes of the Constitution, not only can we meaningfully differentiate between money and speech, but we can't meaningfully differentiate between a person and a group of people, whether in, you're in a nonprofit, a union, or a corporation. And this is what you see Americans so rightfully up in arms about. Mm -hmm. well, and also the flood of dark money. Um, that um, 2010 Supreme Court decision um, with that, 
They also issued an eight to one ruling saying that we needed to pass robust disclosure act so we know who's speaking in our political process. But we have failed as a country to pass disclosure law at the federal level. And we've been working eight years to pass disclosure law in New Hampshire, which passed unanimously through the New Hampshire Senate, passed um, overwhelmingly bipartisan support through the House, the House, and it was vetoed by our governor this year. Um, and so it's really important that we are vigilant to knowing who's speaking in our political process. When you see ads, ad after ad after ad, not being paid for by a candidate, but being paid for by a special interest group. When you open your mailbox close to an election and out comes several dozen leaflets, many of them are not paid for by the candidates. And so we have to understand as voters who is paying to influence our elections and why we need to end this uh, mm. outsized interest on, like Jim said, a very few individuals. And by that, a hundred families that are giving 60% of the money in our political discourse. Mm, the statistics are amazing, really, when, mm. you, when you think about it. And then often, when you do get something, the name of the group is, can be misleading. Let's put it that way. You can't the, really tell. This is, this is happening at the state level for uh, races for state senate right here in New Hampshire. A handful of days before an election, uh, leaflets and TV ads will come out uh, paid for by motherhood for goodness or goodness uh, uh, support yeah. <laughs> Americans for motherhood. Let's say, it's, uh, and it'll be dark money. And and this group uh, will promulgate falsehood, lies about a particular candidate, lies that that normally anyone who would put their face behind an ad like that would not dare do because it's, it's egregious. And the candidate can't rebut it because there's only one or two or three days before the election. And this really, I know this really bothers conservative members of the state Senate right here in New Hampshire. This is a problem of dark money. Dark money meaning money that is being flowed by big donors, usually from out of state, into our state. We don't know where it's coming from. And because of that, they can lie about candidates and candidates can't do a darn thing about it. Mm -hmm. So this is, this is another reason that uh, groups like ours from across the spectrum come together around wanting to fix this plumbing problem in U.S. politics. Yeah, I, think, I think regardless whether you're conservative or liberal, it's disturbing. Yeah, to have falsehoods spread yeah, about you as a candidate, yeah. uh, it, it's not fair and it's definitely not helpful for voters to being given yep. lies, you know, a day or two before and, the election. And, um, but also in our in our gubernatorial race, um, you saw the candidate spending a million dollars, and then these dark money groups spending multiple more, million dollars. Right? Yeah. Jim cited um, the the last to this 2016 U.S. Senate race, but what we saw in that race is that c candidates spent, you know, a significant amount of money, but it was way dwarfed by the dark money and the super PACs that spent mm -hmm. the majority of money in that election. I know when I was raising my son, I said, if you're going to make a statement, put your name on it. Yeah. Yeah. He posted a poster in, in high school that could have been a little controversial, you know, but I said, well, if you're going to do it, do it, but you have to sign your name. Yeah. When we go to town meeting, we all stand up and we say our name. You know, if we are testifying to the legislature, you say your name and where you're from. And it's a really important part of the discourse that, um, but we're, it's drowned out right now by the influence mm -hmm. of dark money in our political discourse. And there, there are people who argue, and this is the opposite side that we take, that, <laughs> that if I have to put my name to this mailing that I'm sending out, I can't lie anymore because my name is attached to it. Well, that's a good thing yeah. that people's name agree. is attached, <laughs> and therefore they can't lie. That's a good yeah. thing, not a bad thing. I totally agree with yeah. that. Now, uh, you all reach out to people because there, there's so many things. Often, I think people get overwhelmed by the system around them. Maybe they've never even written a letter to the editor mm -hmm. or maybe even gone to town meeting. And I, I know one of the things I, I think it's recent on, on your website, Olivia, with Open Democracy, is uh, you have how to go about doing a warrant mm -hmm. article. Because mm -hmm. most of the towns, I, I live in a city, we don't do that, but in the towns, that's how government is really run, you know, at a certain level. And uh, what other things, I guess, are, are you doing to educate people and get them involved? Thank you. And, and I think back to the petition warrant article, um, many years ago, New Hampshire started this campaign for petition warrant articles, and 82 towns have called on um, Congress to enact um, campaign finance reform 
um, mm -hmm. through this 28th Amendment, which culminated this year in the New Hampshire becoming the 20th state um, calling on this. And so this was individual citizens that took a clipboard to their town transfer station, collected names, stood at the town meeting, and overwhelmingly this passed um, in huge majorities. And so that effort is well underway with over a third of New Hampshire towns calling on um, Congress to enact changes to, to change big money in politics. But I think, um, you know, sometimes people might not write a letter to the editor or call their senator, but there's books that you can, you know, there's lots of different books or podcasts or videos around this issue. And you could watch one, share it on social media. Um, you know, the, there's a great story about uh, folks in the Mount Washington Valley area that started a book club. Um, and then started reading about this. And then they started doing actions and started, you know, we all start in different place, um, but democracy is something that we all do. And so if you're not comfortable doing that, someone called me the other day and said, can I call my legislator at home? And I was like, yes, in New Hampshire you can. <laughs> um, and But if you've never done it before, yeah, give funny. us a call at Open Democracy. We want you to participate mm -hmm. um, and have your voice heard in our political conversation around money and politics and we really want to provide um, resources on our website and tools for citizens um, to know how to do these different activities um, but the other thing that we do because we're our organization was founded by granny d and it's the 20th year of her walk across the country we have community theater performance reenacting her walk and so um, coming in 2020 there'll be another round of community theater so if you don't you know if you want to go see a play about money and politics, um, you can engage in theater. Um, mm -hmm. So we all engage in, in this uh, work differently, and we try, to, we try our best um, to provide a, a menu of options for people to be involved um, in campaign finance reform. But the best thing to do is educate yourself and educate your, your community. Um, and there's some great films, too. Some people love to show films in their community. So there's lots of different ways mm -hmm. to engage in um, learning more um, and also um, really creating a dialogue. We have this unique um, opportunity here in New Hampshire where all of the candidates who are running for president are holding town hall meetings. And we can go and say to the presidential candidates, we need your help. Um, the first thing that you do when you arrive in Washington is fix our democracy. And it's really important that we engage in that dialogue with our politicians, both sides of the aisle, as well as, um, you know, a mm -hmm. conversation with your neighbor. Yeah, that's... There, and there are three yeah. Republicans running for U.S. Uh, for, for president yeah. in, in the primary. Yes, there's William a Will. Republican primary mm -hmm. for U.S. Senate. It's happening in New Hampshire. And we're still in, the Republicans are still having a primary. There is a primary in here in New some Hampshire. Some states, yes, four have states eliminated have, it. Yeah, four states have done that, but not New Hampshire. And these candidates, the three the candidates running uh, against Donald Trump, are here in New Hampshire. And you can ask them to get behind the 28th Amendment. Uh, you can ask them for their views on a whole variety of issues associated with campaign dark money, foreign money, uh, transparency. Uh, you can ask them uh, voting rights, uh, redistricting. You can ask them questions about what their what their position on this issue. And if you're if you're a progressive or a Democrat, I would urge you to because the bill in Congress is supported by almost all Democrats. Uh, only one Republican is behind the the resolution that would launch the 28th Amendment process. Uh, language going back to the states, 38 of which are required to ratify. And if you're a progressive or a Democrat, go to your conservative neighbors, your Republican neighbors and friends. And with respect for, from where conservatives come from, work on this issue. Work on persuading them to ask their representatives in their various states. Now we have our, our delegation, our four-person delegation in Washington are, are all four Democrats. Ask them, ask our four-person delegation to ask their peers in Congress who are Republicans to get behind the bill. Don't just, don't just be content uh, having co-sponsored the bill yourself. Go to your peer in Congress and bring Republicans on board. So it, mm -hmm. it's very important that progressives and Democrats work with respect going to Republicans and conservatives, bringing them on board. And again, two-thirds of Republicans back this. So Republicans back it. We need 
to bring mm. that bipartisan, cross-partisan, multi-partisan approach to Congress. Yeah, that's, that's a big challenge right now, to be and, honest. And, and we're doing a really good job here in New Hampshire building that kind of yeah. movement, mm -hmm. and we need that yes. sort of grassroots movement to bubble up. Um, and yep. and it does take a little bit of time, right? Mm -hmm. Four years ago, um, there we didn't see the kind of discourse. Now we see money in politics and uh, in the top ten issues that need need to be addressed. Yes, that's and that's because people, citizens, have taken the time to say this is important to me. I'm going to write a letter to the editor. I'm going to learn more. Yep. Um, and we need more and more civic action um, to create mm -hmm. the demand for reform. We're gaining Azer. ground in this issue. Yeah, Azer. Yeah. How about the focus of getting people involved in uh, American Promise? Well, it's, it's just pivotal for all the reasons that you two just described. And I would highlight that in this Congress, it's the first time that you know a serious piece of 28th Amendment legislation has been introduced mm. with a Democrat and a Republican as lead sponsors with John Katko, a Republican in upstate New York, joining Ted Deutsch. But to your point about, you know, the importance of maybe your elected official as a Democrat bringing a Republican on board, it's one of the key points of emphasis that American Promise really teaches people how to meaningfully do if you're getting involved at the grassroots level, where there are American Promise associations across the country, in Ohio and Pennsylvania and Maine and everywhere, that are going through deep training supported by our staff, learning how to have powerful meetings with elected officials, how to write letters to the editor, how to do warrant articles, local resolutions. And we're seeing all of these local chapters you know, come together to round out this national focus. One of the most powerful demonstrations is at our National Citizen Leadership Conference, which we have every year in Washington, D.C., the next one is going to be October 19th through the 21st, where these people from all across the country will convene and show that this is a national project. It's made up of local ones, but here we are together in the Capitol, mm -hmm. fanning out on the final day of the conference, the Citizen Lobby Day, to deliver this message to Congress. We're here and, and we want action. And one of the most exciting things about this year's conference is we're going to be delivering the actual text blown up on beautiful parchment paper of HB 504 <laughs> to the entire New Hampshire congressional delegation, all of whom are supportive. It's fantastic. And now we're telling them, let's go get some of your colleagues on the other side of the aisle, and let's get this sent back out to the states because we're ready. And I'm collecting lots of different signatures <laughs> of New Hampshire voters on that parchment paper. So if you want to stop by and, and sign it before it goes to the New Hampshire delegation, um, look us up at opendemocracynh.org and uh, make right. sure you add your name. Um, and that's right here in Concord, right? right? Here in Concord. For, with, I'll let you give the address in case <laughs> so I have So we're right next to the State House in the Patriot Building, uh, 4 Park Street, mm -hmm. on the third floor. Okay, that's great. You can walk right in. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I grew up in Washington, D.C., and my parents didn't even have a vote. You know, when, mm. when I was 11, we moved to Maryland and they got the vote. <laughs> they couldn't vote for anybody. So I, I, the importance of being able to vote really means a lot to me, I know. And um, it's good to see so many people. I, in a way, it's bad that we have to have so many people working on the issue. But it's so great to see people at various, you know, organizations and coming together from, like you say, sometimes, you know, slightly different perspectives. But you know this is a core value for our democracy and that it's it's working together. Yeah, and we're That's coming gonna up make on us the succeed. 100th anniversary of women getting the right to vote. Um, and as Azer says, it's difficult to amend the Constitution, but it was, it's was it been done before. And we have to just remember that, you know, 100 years ago, women didn't have the right to vote, and now they do. And so these changes to the Constitution evolve with our society. And it's really important as we look at a um, 28th Amendment to learn from um, the history mm -hmm. of how the Constitution has been amended. And it's been amended for other, mm -hmm. for other uh, issues as well. Definitely. And um, I don't know, I'm going to do a time check if you don't mind <laughs> how much time we have left here. See if we can go back into some of these. But I, yeah, 10 minutes. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, 
Okay, we have to, we're down to the last 10 minutes. <laughs> and uh, let me just mention that at the end of the show, uh, your contact information for you and your organizations will be on screen for people you know, to look up. And that um, people will also have an opportunity to see this either on their local public access uh, channel here in Concord, or I think you're going to try to spread it around the state to other ones. And you can also look at uh, your ConcordTV.org uh, and watch it on TV if you don't catch it you know, so during the day. As we're waiting for a constitutional amendment, or as we're continuing to organize and build for a constitutional amendment, there are things we can do right now um, to change the way elections are funded. And so one of the ways to transform the way elections are funded is to pass legislation um, that creates an alternative system to privately financed elections. And in New Hampshire, we're working on a system called voter-owned elections. And this system would give each voter four $25 certificates to give to the candidate of their choice. If you choose conservative candidates, you give the, your certificate to the conservative candidates, or if you choose different candidates. Um, and what, what it does is it changes the incentives. Instead of call, calling those people with tremendous wealth to, to donate to your campaign, you put voters at the center. And then it also gives voters incentives to say, I want to assign my certificates to candidates that share my values. And that's really important. That um, piece of legislation um, was introduced earlier this year, um, is um, still in the Senate. Um, the committee in the Senate will be working on it later this fall um, with a vote in early 2020. And it's really important that we know that there's alternative systems than the system we have. Mm -hmm. Um, and to advocate and to raise your voice um, so that we can become the next state that has a voter-owned elections. And there's different ways of doing this. Maine and Arizona and Connecticut have these systems of um, publicly financed elections. In Maine, they give grants. In New York City, um, they use um, an eight-to-one match with a small donor contribution. Um, and, it, and other communities um, have these certificates that are used. And it really changes... Um, who, are, who has the political power in our discourse, but also what candidates run. Mm -hmm. um, because if we reduce the money barrier for candidates to run for office, um, you see a different, different uh, people willing to seek leadership. You're yeah. going to have more ideas, more different kinds of candidates, more approaches to problem solving, and that's better. Voters have yeah. more choice, and problems are going to get solved quicker. And the, the other good thing about voter-owned elections is that candidates, and, and none of it is compulsory, candidates who wish to continue dialing for dollars in Washington or California or what have you can do so. We're not saying you don't have to do it. No. But for candidates who don't want to do that anymore, there's an option. And they can not only campaign among people who can vote for them, they can raise enough money, sufficient mm -hmm. sum of money, to be a viable candidate, to be a competitive candidate from those same people. So not only can you, you, you have, a, you have a, a town hall meeting or a, 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 dinner, a, a dinner at someone's house or an open house at someone's house, not only can you woo them as a voter, you can woo their certificate mm -hmm. from them. So it fixes the misalignment that we now have in our elections where you go out and you go to California to get money and you spend half your time doing that instead of talking to your voters. And by aligning uh, your, your, your communication with voters about issues your, your, uh, and, and the, the ability to raise sufficient sums of money, candidates can, can, can uh, have motivations that are, that are much more correctly uh, tuned to mm -hmm. the needs of their district. That's in, a huge, yeah. In Sorry. Seattle, there's a democracy voucher program, yeah. very similar to what Olivia mentioned being described here. And, you know, it's been one or two years about it in effect. And all estimations point to just what you're talking about, increased diversity in the candidates, more candidates running, people who wouldn't normally have been able to run, deciding to run for public office, which is a very positive thing for all of these publicly funded election models, one of the unfortunate consistencies is there's the need to defend the legality of what these systems are under the current constitutional interpretations where you're spending valuable time and resources tied up in battles in the courts with people saying, hey, Buckley versus Vallejo, hey, Citizens United, hasn't the Supreme Court says that something about this is unconstitutional? So it's a very good thing in our opinion that 
these are happening at the same time that this constitutional amendment effort is happening, but our constitutional amendment will make things like this far more robust and easier yeah, one, to defend. One of the most surprising calls I ever got was from my senator, <laughs> you know, and I'm like, I, you know, it was nice conversation and stuff, but it was like, wow, it just puts the impact. Even, even I am getting a call, you know, as the fundraiser type call. And because uh, I'd rather have my tax dollars that pays their salary, have them working on issues <laughs> and not on raising money, you know, when you get right down to it. And I, I'm sure a lot of them really don't like the process either. That you, like you say, you almost get stuck with it. I should add another good thing about the Seattle program, the, uh, the voter dollar program, the certificates, is that it has increased voter participation in the political process. So people are mailed or you know, digitally evolved to that point who might not previously have been involved in politics. My vote doesn't matter. I don't care. And all of a sudden, candidates are contacting them. What is your opinion on this particular local issue? And the candidate is, is, is calling them upon them for two reasons. Number one, they want, their, they, they want your vote. Number two, they want your dollars. And so that, that, that voter is now incentivized in two ways to become involved again in the process. So our, so our rather frighteningly low political participation rate in the United States, uh, as we've seen in the Seattle program, rises up. And again, we have a government that is, instead of representing the needs of uh, you know, wealthy billionaires in San Francisco, is representing the needs of all the people. That's a better government. Mm -hmm. And what, my <laughs> best, what I love the most about like, looking at the history of, of this program is when you looked at it, when it had privately financed elections, there were dots on a map that showed where the money was coming from, from elections. And it was from a handful of individuals in wealthy neighborhoods. And then after the, this system was enacted in, mm. in Seattle, you saw dots throughout the city, mm. all right. different neighborhoods of participation <clears throat> rates. And that's really what we truly want, right? We want a government of, by, and for the people. And in order to do that, we, we the citizens, need to own our elections. We need to be, um, mm. and these systems really can transform the problems of big money, coupled with an amendment to the Constitution um, to eliminate dark money mm -hmm. um, and eradicate it. I, that's what I want to say. We want to eradicate the dark money in our political <laughs> process. Uh, I, I think we're coming to the end of our program. And as I said, we hope to have a uh, series of programs. And some of the future uh, topics would be things like citizens funded elections. We talked a little bit about it, but getting mm -hmm. more in depth on that. Gerrymandering, which even in the state of New Hampshire, there's some gerrymandering, which I think a lot of people don't really realize. It's not severe as some other states, but there's a little bit of it going on. Uh, redistricting, which is coming up uh, next year, I guess. And uh, ranked choice voting is another thing, and the Electoral College, among other issues. So I hope people will tune in, you know, uh, keep an eye out for Take Back Our Democracy. And in the meantime, you, like I said, the uh, contact information for all our guests will uh, be scrolled on the screen at the end of the program. And uh, check out their websites. A lot of interesting things going on. So I want to thank uh, Olivia, Jim, and Azer to uh, take the time, who took the time to come and share their programs and ideas and enthusiasm <laughs> with all of us. Thanks for tuning in. Bye-bye. Open Democracy is a nonpartisan, nonprofit organization working to change the way elections are funded to minimize the influence of special interest money on politics, as well as to ensure that we have fair electoral districts and, and an inclusive democracy. 80% of New Hampshire voters, regardless of their political affiliation, agree that special interests have more influence than voters. How can you get involved? Ask candidates where they stand on money and politics. Urge your state representative and senator to vote for campaign finance reform, an independent redistricting commission, and full disclosure of campaign contributions. Write letters to the editor and attend our educational programs like a screening of the film Dark Money. For more information and educational resources, check out our website at opendemocracynh.org. Thanks for listening, and remember, it's not just up to us. This is your democracy, so get involved.